Turn with me to Luke chapter 1. We're going to look at verse 26 through 45. I want to talk to you here, just kind of a very simple devotional. And we're going to talk about Mary, the mother of Jesus. When it comes to, to Mary, you have two extremes in the Christian church. One is, and I think both do dishonor to her. You have one where she's exalted, and literally in some places where she is considered the fourth person of the Trinity. God is God. You can't, you can't take a person and make them into uh, another person of the Godhead. And uh, it does terrible dishonor to her. And I'm sure she, she disapproves of it. Uh, another, you know, you have her, you know, exalted to the point of being a mediator. The scripture makes it clear there's one mediator between God and man, and that's Jesus Christ. God became a man and he died on the cross, and he is the way to salvation. Now, the other extreme, which you find in uh, Protestant churches, is where Mary is degraded. It's a reaction to, I think, the, you know, the, 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 the extreme on the left, and you end up where Mary is dishonored. And in the scriptures, you get a true picture of Mary and the place that God wishes her to be in our hearts. So I want to, you know, attempt through the Holy Spirit to do my best to just share with you some scriptures, and let's look at what the Word of God speaks and says about Mary. So in Luke chapter 1, verse 26... The Word of God tells us, Now in the sixth month, the angel Gabriel was sent by God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph, of the house of David, the virgin's name was Mary. And having come in, the angel said to her, Rejoice, highly favored one, the Lord is with you, blessed are you amongst women. Uh, but when she saw him, she was troubled at the saying and considered what manner of greeting this was, and the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary, for you have found favor with God. And behold, you will conceive in your womb and bring forth a son and shall call his name Jesus. And he will be great and will be called the Son of the Highest. And the Lord God will give him the throne of his father David. And he will reign over this house of Jacob forever. And of his kingdom there will be no end. And Mary said to the angel, How can this be since... I do not know a man. And the angel answered and said to her, The Holy Spirit will come upon you, and the power of the highest will overshadow you. Therefore also the Holy One, who is to be born, will be called the Son of God. Now indeed, Elizabeth, your relative, has also conceived a son in her old age, and this is how the sixth month of, of her, who was called barren. For with God nothing is impossible. Then Mary said, Behold, the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. I'm going to stop there. We're going to look a second at the following verses. So, again, I want to take a look at, at, at Mary, the, the mother of Jesus, and we're going to look at, at a couple of key things. First thing I want you to look at is a mother's surrender. And it is a massive surrender. Look, we, we are all called to surrender our lives to Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. To become a Christian, you know, it, it is not just a matter of believing that he died on the cross for you, but recognizing that he is the Lord God, the Lord and the King, and to bow our hearts to him and to surrender our lives to him. And that always brings tremendous implications with it, some of which people are not willing to follow through with, which, again, it will lead them astray. Mary surrendered her life to the Lord. And let me tell you, you're talking about a surrender and, again, a follow-through that is truly amazing. Verse, 39, uh, verse 38, Then Mary said, Behold the maidservant of the Lord, let it be to me according to your word. And the angel departed from her. Now, Mary, God is saying through Gabriel, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to place this holy embryo within your womb. And you're going to bring forth a, a, a son. You're going to bring forth a savior, the Meshach, the promised Messiah. And then understand, Mary, here's this young, probably 14, 15-year-old girl who's now been chosen by God and, and called to do this incredible thing, bring forth the Messiah into the world. And again, she's a virgin. I want you to understand the, the implications of, of, what, of what that means. Mary says, let it be done to me according to your word. She just, again, totally submits, totally surrenders. Now, now she's got to go and she's got to tell her fiancé, okay, and in the, 
the Jewish, in the Jewish culture, to be engaged was the equivalent of being married. That's why if you read Matthew chapter 1, when Mary told Joseph that she was pregnant, what did Joseph do? He didn't go, all right, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, Mary. You got, you got a holy embryo within you and he's going to be the... No, that's not what he did. You know what he did? He, he planned to divorce her, to put her away. And I'll tell you, that was a gracious thing because he actually had the right under the law to do what? Stoned. To have her stoned. To have her, even though they had, they had not, the marriage had not been consummated. They hadn't uh, uh, actually gone to what is called the wedding proper. They were in a state of engagement. And for the woman to be found with a child in the state of engagement, the fiancé, the man, had the right to have her stoned. Joseph was an honorable man. He just chose to put her away quietly. Of course, the Holy Spirit then spoke to Joseph. And Joseph realized that it was a, a miracle of the Holy Spirit, a miracle of God. And Joseph became obedient to God. She also had to go and tell her father. Now, I'm going to just talk here about her father because she had to tell her mother too. But we know, how many of you fathers sitting here, if your daughter came to you, and again, out of wedlock, and she said to you she was pregnant by the Holy Spirit, how many of you would be, all right, right? You would have taken her down to Bergen Pines and had her admitted, Right? She thinks she got pregnant by the Holy Spirit. And again, this is, in a, this is in a, an extremely religious, legalistic culture. So let me just say this. The surrender of Mary to the Lord brought pain immediately. She's a pregnant girl living in a small town in Nazareth. You know how small town people can be who know all your business? People who know all your business, maybe you experience this in your families, maybe you experience in your, you know, your immediate little circumference of, of people that you live with, your neighborhood. All of a sudden you see a girl who's not married walking down the street and she's showing, you know how people talk. And by the way, that picture, that picture comes from the movie The Nativity and that's exactly what happened here. Those, those two women just walk past Mary, they know she's pregnant and you know what they're doing? They're doing this. You know how people can be with this? You know, God, 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 equi God equates gossip with murder. He equates gossip with murder. Gossips and slanderers. He puts in the same category as murder. You know why it is? It's, it's, it's literally the murder of a person's character. It, it, when people gossip and slander somebody, it's the murder of their character. And God puts it on the same plane as the murder of a body. Now, you, can, you might not agree with that, and you can go and argue with God about it, but that, that's what's going on here. These, these people in, in, little town, in little town Nazareth, they started opening their mouths and belittling and, and gossiping about Mary. And there's this one scene in the movie, I don't know if it's as a father, as a Christian, uh, watching that movie, Mary is weeping because of, again, all the pressure. Joseph, Joseph has not accepted it. Her family has not accepted it. She's being gossiped about by the, you know, the people in the neighborhood. And she just breaks down. Again, 14, 15-year-old kid breaking down crying. And when I, when I see that, there's a part of me where I started weeping when I was watching this scene. And I literally just wanted to go over and just like, like, like almost like if, if God had made me an angel <laughs> to cover her. And just to be able to say to Mary, Mary, it's okay. I know him. I know him. I, I know, I know the, 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 the Messiah that you're carrying. I know him in my heart. He died for me. He bled for me. He suffered for me. He has redeemed me. He has saved me. I just to, to cover her and let her know that. Of course, the Holy Spirit did that. But there was a surrender. And that surrender went on. And we're going to look at that. Second thing I want you to look at here is a mother's blessing. In the passages that follow... Luke chapter 1, verse 39 through 45. Now Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste to a city of Judah and entered the house of Zacharias and greeted Elizabeth. That's her cousin. And it happened when Elizabeth heard the greeting of Mary and the babe leaped in her womb and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit and then she spoke out with a loud voice and said, Blessed are you amongst women and blessed is the fruit of your womb. Look at the word blessed three times. But why is this granted to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For indeed, as soon as the voice of your greeting sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Blessed is she who believed 
for there will be a fulfillment of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now it's blessed. It's blessed to be a mother of a child. I watch the mothers and I watch my wife with three babies, four babies. And um, just, you ever see mothers do this? They walk around and, you know, they, I, let's see if I can do it. I, I, I don't, you know, if I had a keg, it would be easier. You know, I have a six pack, not a keg, but. <laughs> you ever seen mothers do that? Ima imagine having the savior of the world and just, just, I mean, the blessing that Mary was experiencing. How, how about the blessing of holding, holding God in your arms, looking into the eyes of the Son of God. How about the, the blessing of teaching the Son of God how to read, to write, and to pray? Don't understand this. Jesus learned. And people, he came, he, he was fully God, but he became fully man, fully human. And, you know, there's this concept that when, when Jesus was, was laying in the, the manger, that he had infinite knowledge. No, he was a baby. He was fully human and he was fully God. God surrendered himself to become fully human. Mary taught him the word. Mary taught him how to pray. Mary taught him how to write. Mary taught him how to read. How awesome, how awesome is, you know, is that? Great scene from the movie The Passion, and I'm going to show it to you in a second, but here's a few pictures. Joseph likely died somewhere between when Jesus was 12 and 30. Jesus, as a, a Jewish man, would have become the head of the family. He became the carpenter. He ran the carpentry shop. But there was a rich, beautiful relationship that he had with his mom. And uh, in this scene, it's, it's great. She puts some water in his hands and he splashes her. And then it, it, he splashes her and she kind of moves away and then all of a sudden, oh, did we, did we just lose that? Oh, there we go. And then all of a sudden he just hugs her and kisses her. You know, see, like a, like a, a teenage boy. I see my, my son when he grabs my wife and he just, you know, 21-year-old guy, he grabs her and he pulls her into his arms and he just hugs her and kisses her and shows her this, this rich affection. You know, how blessed, how blessed was it for Mary to be the mother, okay, of the humanity of Jesus the Savior. Great blessing. A mother's prophesied pain. When Jesus was dedicated in the temple, a prophet named Simeon came, and it's a beautiful passage in Luke chapter 2, verse 34 through 35. And Simeon, he took the baby in his arms and blessed them and said to his mother, Mary, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel and for a sign which will be spoken against. And then look at the words. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. You read that passage, you think about it. A, a sword, Mary, is going to pierce through your soul that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. What was he talking about? And I think in Mary's life, there is again, there's wonderful blessing, there's wonderful joy, and then there's also this grief, there's this pain. Again, you see, it, you see it early on. We were all born to live. That little baby that she held in her arms was born to die. Artists have, have portrayed Jesus in his early years. There was a shadow of a cross that was over his life. He, he had come to, to die for the sins of the world. Prophesied thousands of years before he ever came. He came to, to die. He came to be that mediator, that savior. One other wonderful picture, and I'm sure in Mary's mind, this, this would be something that she would see. In Joseph's carpentry shop, there is the, the young Jesus, and Joseph carrying a beam, and all of a sudden, again, there's that, there's that reflection, that shadow of the cross over his life. And there was an awareness that Mary had, that, that he had come. He had come to do something Massive. He had come to do something huge. She, she knew he had come to, to do something that had never been done before. To provide forgiveness for our sins. In Luke chapter 2, verse 48 through 50, Jesus was 12 years old and he went up to the temple. And he got busy. He got, he got busy. He was, actually, he was actually teaching or he was debating the priests in the temple. 
And Mary and Joseph, they got caught up with their family and everybody kind of left because everybody traveled in a, travel, uh, in a caravan and they were on their way back to Nazareth and they were on their way back and all of a sudden they realized that Jesus wasn't with them. So they headed back to the temple and when they found Jesus, verse 48, so when they saw him, they were amazed and his mother said to him, son, why have you done this to us? Imagine this too. I don't think Mary had ever experienced a moment where he had ever done anything to them. You know that kids... As soon as they kind of reach that age, all of a sudden they start doing things to you. Any mothers ever experienced that? Right? Can, do kids ever cause grief for you? No, my wife's shaking her head and saying, no, never. Right? It happens, right? Well, all of a sudden a mom can, you know, a mom's getting grief from the kids. Well, this, imagine having Jesus, the Son of God. He never caused any problem like this. And all of a sudden, she's amazed. Son, why have you done this to us? And these words are, are somewhat cutting. Jesus says to her, look, uh, your father and I, okay, she goes, look, your father and I have sought you anxiously. Now watch. And he said to them, why did you seek me? Did you not know that I must be about my father's business? He, he was bigger than the family. He was bigger than the little town in Nazareth. He was, he was bigger than Israel. But they did not understand the statement which he spoke to them. And there's, there's confusion here. And just a, a little bit of a sword, just, just the sword just cutting into Mary's heart. In Mark chapter 3, verse 20 through 21, when Jesus started his ministry, then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. And when his family, now his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him, for they said he is out of his mind. Don't you understand his family? There's an erroneous teaching that arose about 1,500 years ago that Mary was perpetually a virgin. The church starts to get into that, that sex is a sin. Sex out of marriage is a sin. Sexual relations in the marriage covenant is a blessing. And Mary, after she gave birth to Jesus, her and Joseph had other children. Here in verse 55 of, of Matthew chapter 13. Is this not the carpenter's son, they said? Is not his mother called Mary and his brothers? He had four brothers. They, the word there for brothers is Adelphos. It means brothers. James, who became the leader of the church in Acts chapter 15. Joseph, Simon, and Judas. And he had sisters. And it goes on, are they not all with us? Where then did this man get all these things? Jesus had a family. What happened, and we're told, and again, in Mark chapter 3, when Jesus started his ministry, his family was not saved. Now, Mary was, but his brothers and sisters were not. And his brothers and sisters, all of a sudden, Jesus is teaching, and he goes into the temple, he goes into the synagogue in Nazareth, and he has declared that he is the Messiah. He has read from the scroll of Isaiah chapter 60, and he has declared that he is the Meshach. His family thinks he's crazy. And here is Mary in between her unsaved children, and Jesus, the Savior of the world. Now, have you ever been in that situation, Mom? Have you ever been in the situation? How many moms came up here today, and you know, they prayed, and they said, you know what, I've got some kids who are unsaved. Would you pray for them with me? You know, and here's, here's the mom in between. Again, in between the saved and in between the saved. In between those who have been born once and those who have been born twice. In between the, the children who are of the world and the children who are of God. And let me tell you something, it could be a conflict. It could be a conflict in the home. And here is Mary, she's stuck in between this. Look at a, another passage, just if we move ahead here. Mark chapter 3, 31 through 35. There came then his brethren and his mother, and standing without, sent unto him, calling him. And the multitude sat about him, and they said unto him, Behold, thy mother and thy brethren without seek for thee. Here's Mary again with Jesus' sisters and his brothers, and they have come seeking ye. And look at what Jesus says. Again, kind of cutting words. And he answered them, saying, Who is my mother or my brethren? And he looked around about on them, which sat about him, and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of God... The same is my brother and my sister and my mother. You know what Jesus is saying there? God has many children, but no grandchildren. You get that? God has many children, 
which means you have to make a decision to become a follower of Him. You have to make a choice. You, you have to come and surrender to His will to become a part of His family. Just because you were born in a Christian home and mommy and daddy are Christians or mommy's a Christian or daddy's a Christian. You ever see people, I, well, I was raising... Have you made a choice to take Jesus Christ into your heart? Have you made the decision that is the ultimate decision? It is the decision that will determine, let me tell you something, your eternal destiny. Have you made a choice? Have you made the decision to take Jesus Christ into your heart as your Lord and Savior? That's what Jesus is saying there. These are my brothers. These are my sisters. Even from his own blood. Even his own blood. If they had not, if they had not made that decision, that choice, they were not. They were not in that saving relationship with the Father. And again, they were cutting words. They were getting Mary in bet Mary's in between this. A mother's grief. That's Mary standing at the cross. A sword will pierce your heart. In John chapter 19, 25 through 28, now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother. Imagine, imagine, I know the tears that I have shed through my, I have not wept more over anything in my life than over the death of Jesus Christ, of him hanging on the cross and dying for me. This, this morning, I, I, was, I was meditating, I was meditating on the cross of Jesus reading the Word, praying, looking at some pictures, and weeping. That, that Almighty God would leave His throne to come down for that, that cross and hang there six hours, one Friday, with nails in His hands and His feet, bleeding, suffering, and dying for me. But imagine watching Him as His mother, dying for you. And His mother, sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. And when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. And then he said to his, the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. You know, I believe Jesus commissioned John to take care of his mom because his brothers and sisters still were not Christians yet. They would become. His brothers would become leaders in the church. But they hadn't up to that point. So there is Mary. She's with John, Mary Magdalene, the other Mary. And there she is at the cross watching Jesus, her son, her beloved son, dying for her sins as he died for all of our sins upon that cross. And there when he was taken off. Did she know? Last thing I just want to share with you here. You find Mary in the book of Acts at Pentecost. She's one of the 120 when the Holy Spirit comes. <clears throat> Call this a mother's honor. It tells us this in Acts chapter 1, verse 12 through 14. Then they returned to Jerusalem from the Mount of Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day's journey. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying. Very careful to mention the 11 apostles. Remember, Judas has killed himself. And when they had entered, they went up into the upper room where they were staying. Peter, James, John, and Andrew, Philip, Thomas, Bartholomew, and Matthew, and James, the son of Alphaeus, Simon the Zealot, and Judas the son of James. That's not Judas Iscariot. And these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication with the women. And notice, I believe the Holy Spirit very distinctly, he puts this in there. And Mary, the mother of Jesus and with his brothers. They had come to know him. She was there. And when the Holy Spirit came, the Holy Spirit came upon Mary, the promised spirit. There's a scene in the book of, uh, in, the, in the movie Acts, it's going to actually the movie is A.D., and there's a scene where the apostles are waiting with the 120 for the Holy Spirit to come, and they're in the upper room, and they're talking, and Mary's there, and uh, they asked Mary to tell some stories. And she tells a story about Jesus. And um, I'm sure this is the way it was. This is not from the scriptures. But she says, one day when Jesus was four or five years old, he was sitting at the table and she had given him some jam, some grape jam. And um, he was eating it and he got it all over his face. 
And when she turned around, she looked and she got startled. She was like, oh Jesus, what have you done? And he started to cry. And then she looked at him and she said, you never know. And then Peter stood up and Peter said, you never know. It's a wonderful word, you never know. It's like, you never know when he's going to break through. You never know when God's going to do that incredible thing, that moment. You never know. I just want to end with this, uh, this final word. On this Mother's Day, let us honor the mother of our Lord by obeying her words that are recorded in Scripture. I guess you didn't expect that to come from an evangelical Bible-believing church on a Sunday morning, right? Let us obey the mother of our Lord by obeying her words that are recorded in the Scripture. And here they are. His mother said to the servants, we looked at this a few weeks ago when he turned the water into wine, whatever he says to you, do it. How about that, huh? Let's obey the words of Mary, the mother of Jesus. I don't know about you, but I'm trying. It's the goal of my life. It's the passion of my soul to try to bring my life into accord with his will. Whatever he says to you, not what the world says, not what the media says, but what he says, do it, do it. Hey, do you know him? Do you have him in your heart? Is he your Lord and Savior? Let's all bow our heads.